Vatican Library. You see him seated, uh, uh, in, in creating the position of the very first paid Vatican Librarian, librarian whose name is Bartolomeo Platina. This man here is the nephew of, Jul of, um, of Sixtus IV. His name is Giuliano de la Rovere. And you can tell from the prominence of his position and the way that there's this connection between the uncle and nephew that already in this, in this work painted in 1475, there's already a sense of uh, um, um, a legacy or a dynastic type of imagery here. These are other members of the family who are thoroughly horrible. Um, he also gave us the, um, the, he also gave us something that I, I, again, there's certain things about our church that just, Every single time, it's so exciting to me. The Capitoline Museums, which sit on the top of the Capitoline Hill, are the world's first public museum. I do not care what the British Museum writes on their website. They are mistaken. The world's first public museum was opened by Pope Sixtus IV in 1471, almost hours after his papal election. He was in St. John Lateran, planning on moving over to the Vatican, which is where the popes would live as of the 14th century. He looks around at St. John Lateran, where the popes have lovingly preserved several works of ancient art. They threw thick and thin, through disaster and sad, the church had managed to accumulate several great works of antiquity. They had five bronzes. Five bronzes which at that point were already 1,500 years old. He took those bronzes, he put them on the top of the Capitoline Hill, he built a museum around it, and he opened it up to the general public. He created the whole concept of a public museum as a gift of the church. And the reason why he did it was that he was in the midst of a program to try to get the Romans to stop living in the kind of squalor, rough, horrific ways. The stories of people going to Rome in 1400 are horrifying. And the fact is, he's trying to get the Romans to be behind him on this project of renovation. One of the ways he does it is to show them how great they were once. He shows them these works of art and says, this is what we were able to do when we believed in a god that dresses up as a swan to go pick up girls. What do you think we can achieve with our god? And so the, um, the, the Capitoline Wolf is his gift. As a matter of fact, this is too much information, but I, I, this is ah, it's such a good thing. Um, the image of Rome, yeah, you all know that the, the she-wolf is like the Rome symbol. It wasn't always Rome symbol. As a matter of fact, in ancient Rome, it was the SPQR. This is our, mar this is our army. We're going to kill you. And then they moved on to, in the Middle Ages, they had, they had a big statue. Today. It's in the garden of the Capitoline Museums. And it's a lion eating a horse. It's this massive lion eating a horse. And it's kind of a symbol of the rough justice and the might and the swiftness and the power of Rome. And Sixus IV, he looks at this and he's like, this is our symbol. This is who we are. <laughs> this is a horrible symbol. And so he is the one who brought that she-wolf over, and then he commissioned, these are, these are from 1480, he commissioned the two seated children underneath it, and he gave us the image of the she-wolf with Romulus and Remus. The reason why that's such an important image is because if you think kind of coldly about it, um, would you seriously leave children in the hands of she-wolf? I mean, honestly, engaging a she-wolf um, for child sitting services would probably you know, in, in involve a phone call to child <laughs> services, and this is not a good idea. And yet, that she-wolf, instead of doing the instinctive thing, the normal thing for, for an animal to do with a with vulnerable animal would be to eat it, the she-wolf found it in herself. To, to, to take care of these children and to nurture these children. That is probably the greatest metaphor we have for Rome. Any of you who've dealt with Romans, myself yeah. included, um, and I, and I refer to myself as a Roman, we can be a little gruff, and we can be a little rough on, around the edges. And you know, Romans always seem like they, they, they clatter your food down in front of you in the restaurants. They always seem like, yeah, what are you doing here in my shop? I'm really busy right now. I can't believe I actually have to stop and sell you something. Um, the, uh, the, the Romans can be pretty, pretty gruff. But underneath it all, the Romans do have a very warm and very good side. And I love this way that, that, that Sixtus recognizing that the Romans really found an image that would call on its ancient past, but on the same time call, at the, at the call out the best in the Romans. And this is, again, the power of art and imagery. Um, he gave us, again, the library. He built the first bridge to cross the Tiber, the Ponte Sisto. He's, and, and please note, 
all these things he's doing, he's rivaling the ancient world. Because libraries, we haven't had libraries built in Rome since the days of the emperor. Trajan built libraries, Augustine built libraries, and nobody built a library. Then we have the bridges. The bridges were all built in antiquity. There are only two left, one built by Hadrian and one built in the first century BC. He adds a third one built by the papacy. He builds a hospital for the number of pilgrims that are coming into Rome. There's a huge influx after the Jubilee years. He builds a hospital, it's one of the largest in Europe, it's one of the cutting edge in Europe. Unfortunately, the medical techniques that they're using there are still the same as 1475. Um, I know this because I had a child there. <laughs> and um, and uh, fortunately, he, uh, fortunately he, he left enough, apparently, prayer endowment so that we could survive any kind of procedure there. Um, the, uh, and of course, his greatest gift, as far as we're concerned today, his greatest gift is the Sistine Chapel built in his name. The Sistine Chapel has kind of a funny origin. This is it right here. The external view of the Sistine Chapel is not something that you would ordinarily equate with, well, you know, a church. It uh, Actually, for the 15th century, it has a rather striking similarity to a fort. And it was actually designed by a military architect named Baccio Pontelli in 1477. It was he, he was a military architect. And the, the building was designed with one entrance and one exit. It has high walls. It has, it has, it has thick walls. Um, it is high with those thick walls. It has battlements at the top. These are battlements for soldiers to be stationed. And then these little white things here, they're actually holes for pouring boiling oil. So the Sistine Chapel's external, external the view is uh, completely defensive. It is true that in the 15th century, the easiest place to assassinate somebody was actually inside a church. The Duke of Milan was killed in a church, and one of the Medicis was killed in a church, both during the pontificate of Pope Sixtus IV. So we can kind of understand that you know Sixtus takes a look at all the dark nooks and crannies in St. Peter's and is thinking, maybe we could uh, have some other place. So that said, the Sistine Chapel, which has a very, very forbidding exterior, it does. It's also perfect for the conclave, by the way. It, it did actually, it was a natural fit for the conclave. <coughs> defensive set, bless you. Um, the inside of the Sistine Chapel is a completely different story. And it's almost like we're going back to that very early Christian ethos of that interior, exterior uh, type of persona. The external part of the building, it's very off-putting. The inside of the building is wall to wall, the most beautiful art ever gathered in a single space. Sixtus IV not only built the church, he had it decorated. He had it decorated by what a friend of mine refers to as the dream team of Florentine art. He brought down Giotto, no, sorry, Ghirlandaio, who would be the man who would teach Michelangelo how to paint. Um, Michelangelo will join this painting studio when he's 13 years old. Michelangelo can paint the Sistine Chapel ceiling. It's because he was taught by this man. As a matter of fact, the, and then the great irony is that the reason why this man became the teacher of Michelangelo is because he worked in the Sistine Chapel. So 1482, he finishes the work in the Sistine Chapel, the calling of St. Peter and St. Paul. And he goes back to Florence and back to his studio. Three years later, there's a knock on the workshop door, and there's Leonardo Buonarroti holding 10-year-old Michelangelo by the hand, saying, hey, uh, are you one of those guys who painted in the Sistine Chapel? And they was like, yeah, we worked on it. They say, oh, could you teach my kid to paint? So there's sort of a great relationship around the Sistine Chapel between Michelangelo and Gerland Dio. Um, the other two painters who worked in there were Botticelli. There was actually quite a team. But um, Botticelli did this painting here, and uh, this one here is by Perugino. And what I do want you to understand in these works is that if already with Leo the Great yesterday, I was telling you about a parallel between things like uh, Life of St. Paul, St. Peter, Life of Christ, Life of St. Paul. With the Franciscans, we see this becoming more and more intensified. So we have the stories of the Nativity, or the stories of the Nativity of Mary, parallel with the stories of Christ. We have the stories of, um, of Francis with the stories of Christ. And then when you get into a room which is dedicated to a bunch of theologians, the people who hang around in the Sistine Chapel are the 400 members, 300, 400 members of the, of the papal court. These are, in the 15th, 16th century, the men who are gathered in that room are the papal theologians, the papal preachers, the members of the papal court. You are looking at the most educated, wealthy, influential men in all of Europe. The men who gathered in the Sistine Chapel, they buy the art, they write the theology, they don't need their Bible stories reminded to them, and whatever you put on that wall had better be better, had better be superior to what they have in their house. It is the ultimate high bar in art. And in one of the most amazing parallels, and this is where I'm headed next, the most amazing parallels in art, we find that what makes the Renaissance so great 
is this insistent and very powerful spirit of rivalry that takes place between artists, between papacies, between past and present, between, between, <coughs> between histories. There is a constant flint in um, there's a constant flint in the Renaissance, which is that of competition, that of always measuring yourself against something else. So they bring in the two most famous painters of the 15th century. Botticelli, those of you who've been to Florence, know that he has an entire room dedicated to him in the Uffizi. Perugino was the highest paid, busiest painter of the 15th century. You said Perugino, and he went, ooh. And so the, um, the paintings they were given <coughs> face each other in the Sistine Chapel. They are quite literally placed right across from each other. Here's the delivery of the keys, and then on this side is Botticelli's. This side of the Sistine <coughs> Chapel are all stories of Moses. This side are all stories from the life of Christ, done in such a way that Moses is always a precursor for something in the life of Christ. It's a dialogue between, it's a, con it's a concordance between the Old and New Testament. Above it, we have the first 30 sainted popes who are painted in niches. We see that Leo started this in 450. We're still doing it a thousand <coughs> years later. I like to call them the popes on the half shell. And the ceiling is painted a blue sky with stars, which is the most typical form of ceiling decoration in that era. Here is the root screen in the Sistine Chapel, which fortunately is still in there. And the fact that we have the root screen in the Sistine Chapel helps us to understand many, many important points. The root screen, unlike any church you guys would ever, ever expect to see, because it's a different ball game in this one, you would expect any of you, if you were to put in a root screen in your church, you would put it in so there was a minimal amount for you guys and there was more room for the faithful. That's not the Sistine Chapel. Two-thirds of the space in the Sistine Chapel is dedicated to clergy. Late people are an afterthought. Women weren't allowed until the 1700s. And the, although they did make a whole mock ceremony for Queen Christine of Sweden because she couldn't really say no for her, to her. The fact is that the, uh, the, it tells you a lot when you're standing in there. And I can't do this for you today. I can't show you in a picture of how this works. But it makes a huge difference what you see when you're standing in the clergy part of this room and what you see when you're standing in the lay people part of the room is very, very different. There are different narratives going on for the different types of people. Um, the, um, the, this is the last pair of paintings before you step into the space of the clergy. It's standing right outside the root screen. Remembering that the root screen also defines the space where the cardinals gather for the conclave. It's in the other side, the clergy section of the root screen, where they set up the chairs for the voting of the conclave, whereas it's the side where the lay people would generally be, where they set up the tables for the counting of the votes and they set up the wood burning stove. This, as the cardinals file in, are the last two works they see. Botticelli paints the punishment of Cora, and, and, and Perugino paints the delivery of the keys. And so this is the most important painting in the room before Michelangelo walks in there. This painting is all harmony. The Perugino pulls out in all the stops. Everything he ever learned how to do in perspective, he's showing you in this painting. You have, um, you have these wonderful orthogonals, that's what those big squares on the ground are called. You have this big, open, very stately space. You can breathe in that wonderful space. You have an eight-sided building in the background, which if you remember is the symbol of it's a baptistry building, so it's a symbol of regeneration and renewal. You have triumphal arches on either side. Those are the triumphal arches of Constantine. So you see the image of triumph, you see the image of renewal, and you have this elegant, very calm lineup. Jesus hands the keys to Peter, the golden key up instead of the other one. So the key, the, the merciful key is the one he's handing. Uh, you have the other apostles who are kind of hanging around going, oh, this is a great moment. Let's go get in the group picture. You have a few random Florentines <laughs> there. Um, the uh, fact of the matter is, it's a very harmonious image of the transmission of authority. Remembering that in that room, that room where they elect the Pope, Perugino was the one who was charged with the job that would explain why the Pope is the Pope. Then above it, across it, you have um, Berpa de Botticelli, who paints the parallel scene from, from, from the story of Moses when Aaron tries to pass on his authority to the Koran family. Uh, to, to, sorry, when Moses tries to pass on his authority to, to Aaron, and the Korah family says, well, that doesn't strike me as fair. I mean, I think we should have some sort of like a contest or something. We could all make, you know, sacrifices. Like, 
you know, let God decide. So, of course, you know, Moses, or, or Aaron makes his, and God says, that's really lovely that you have rosemary as my favorite. And the Gorah family makes theirs, and the, um, the earth opens and swallows them up. Look at the same elements. Both of you, they're talking to each other. They're not two rival artists who walk in and go, I'm not going to talk to you. These are two artists who are at each other's throats for commissions in Florence. They show up in the Sistine Chapel. They plan out their program. It's the same triumphal arch, except it's crumbling. You have this bit of broken Roman building in the background. And look at the crazy sweep and disordered motion of the figures, because this challenging of authority brings chaos. This brings regeneration. These two painters paint place, intentionally placed side by side so that their rivalry could also be a fruitful analysis as Botticelli shows off how he paints and Perugino shows up. These are perfectly within the style of either artist. They show you the importance, the message they send to the clergy is it's essential that you accept the result of this decision because if you don't, this is what will happen. So already we find in the Sistine Chapel that idea of the spark that can be created by putting great minds, great talents in a single room and making them battle it out. The masterminds of these, of all of this is the papacy. The Sistine Chapel's art does not come up because you put a bunch of clever, creative people in the room and you let them do whatever they want. They are guided. They are guided by people who have a long view, people who have a big picture, and they have a sense of a big picture. And these people are rivaling themselves antiquity. I'm showing you a picture of Julius Caesar and Augustus because anybody who knows the Roman Forum knows that the Roman Forum was transformed from 50 BC to 14 AD by two men. One was Julius Caesar, one was Augustus. If Rome was being, began as a city of brick and ended as a city of marble, it was because of the world's most famous uncle-nephew building team, they got to work and they transformed Rome to the capital of an empire, a city that people still flock to, to see the ruins of that city. And in 1400, another uncle-nephew team realized if they could do it, we should be able to do this even better. And that uncle-nephew team was none other than Sixtus IV and his nephew, Giuliano della Rovere, who became Julius II. It is eternally frustrating in, in art to hear the role of these patrons constantly denigrated by the modern age. And I know some of you, some of you are reading, uh, uh, some of you are telling you reading R.A. Scotti's book on Basilica, which I think is a great book in many ways. But when she talks about Julius II, when Ross King talks about Julius II and Michelangelo and the Pope's ceiling, I keep thinking, what a really short-sighted, limited view they have of these men. I will never tell you that Julius II was a deeply spiritual man. However, however, Sixtus IV, he was. Sixtus IV is the man who gave us the feast day of the Immaculate Conception. I can't even begin to tell you the reverberations of that, especially in art. But the fact is, he is the man who put that feast on the calendar. He commissioned the two offices that we the, 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 the we do during that during that feast. I mean, he is the man of the Immaculate Conception. So he did actually give us a great and very lasting spiritual gift in his pontificate. Julius, he becomes pope, and he's like. Right. I don't think I should touch any of that stuff, because I don't really know much about that. But I do know a lot about how to get people to pay attention to me and to take me seriously, because people took Julius really seriously. He said, you know, what we need is a little something that's going to last, that's going to show us as, you know, show us as people who have a long view of history, the past and the present. This is the man who will put together the Vatican collections. This is the man who will finish everything that Sixtus starts. Sixtus builds a bridge. Julius builds the roads to it. Sixtus, Sixtus, um, uh, 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 Sixtus will, um, Sixtus will uh, uh, build the Sistine Chapel and decorate it. Julius will hire Michelangelo to do the ceiling. I mean, this is the most astonishing uncle and nephew team where everything was laid into place by Sixtus. Julius, after that unpleasant pickup of, of Alexander VI Borgia, he then flowers all of this into something that, as I was saying, we remain heavy hitters. People listen to us when we talk about culture because we know a thing or two about it. And this man made sure that we would have a seat at the table 500 years later. 
the um, and then actually before we before we get into the into the, the work of Julius the second I'm going to stop for one more uh, very important event in the transformation of Rome in the Renaissance, and that was the Jubilee year 1500. We've been having Jubilee years from 1300. It started out, was, there were a few hiccups at the beginning, as to be expected. We have a very nice Jubilee in 1300. Um, 1350, um, the Pope wasn't there, so that kind of diminished attendance, um, and so, so on and so forth. Uh, the uh, 1400s, there were a few disasters here and there. 1475, it had a decent showing. All the attention was focused on making sure that 1500 would go without a hitch. It's not unlike the English getting ready for the Olympics last summer. Rome was readying itself in every single way for the um, every single way for the Jubilee year 1500, when Rome would be put back on the map. Um, one of the people who was first in line in this whole spirit of reconciliation and renewal was the Pope himself, who was Alexander VI Borgia, who conveniently converted for the Jubilee year 1500. Uh, not many people know that, uh, that we all know the problematic aspect, but not many people know that in 1497, uh, Alexander VI experienced a huge personal conversion. And he you know, kind of woke up, looked around, and said, this, this, everything I'm doing is wrong. Everything, I, if, if it was a bit like David after the death of his son. That's actually how he compares himself um, and he, uh, he he gets his family out of papal court he, he talks to the whole entire court and says we have to change the way we're doing things he always did it and this is just a, again a pointless print it's not pointless I, I think I love I love this about him Alexander the sixth is now being being you know held up as look at these crazy Catholics by two television shows um, I will not watch them because within the first 15 minutes of the HBO version there were so many technical errors I was like well if he can't even get someone who can tell you, you know, the sheer how things work in 14, 1492, then I'm not going to waste my time watching this. Um, but the fact of the matter is that he's been mocked so much, there's something, something that I think people don't realize. He did do quite a few very good things in his pontificate. Every single time, and he's the first person to tell you this, every single time he does something good, he does it out of his love of the Blessed Virgin. He had a tremendous devotion, his former archpriest of St. Mary Major, and he had a tremendous devotion to the Blessed Virgin. And if there was anything or anyone that could call to the better nature of Alexander VI, it was the Blessed Mother. And so he, for the Jubilee year 1500, decides that he's going to try very hard to get his life in a new path. Granted, it doesn't stick. But you know, for the few years it was very nice, um, and uh, and the fact of the matter is that he um, he will uh, uh, his papal court, his whole entire court, is kind of recruited for this. Out of that spirit, I'm actually getting a point here. Out of that spirit comes this work. <coughs> this is the work that is the direct. The Alexander VI did not commission this work, but the man who commissioned it was Pierre de Legula, who was the right hand man. He's the Secretary of State, basically, to uh, to. Uh, uh, Alexander VI Borgia. He was there, he was part of these inner workings of this whole conversion of the court. The commission for this painting actually comes in in 1497. It's in 1497, like the week after Alexander has this whole long discussion about this huge conversion that the Year de l'Egula, in preparation specifically for Jubilee Year 1500, <coughs> goes out and finds himself a young sculptor to make the monument, the new monument that will go into St. Peter's. It will be the new face of St. Peter's for this new age. So we have all this old art, we've got Giotto and the Cavallinis, and we've got Anopoli Cami, we've got all this old art in there. But now we're turning a new leaf. We're entering into a new era, and they choose a virtually unknown 22-year-old from Florence and say, hey, listen, why don't you do the new work for, for our church? And so that work, now this is what the church looked like in 1500, um, not the church you know today. Um, the oops, it's this one. The Pietà was intended to go originally in that little round, in that little round uh, mausoleum over in the background there. It's meant to be a few feet from you. Um, it was also meant as an altarpiece. I actually just finished a very long article where I read every single thing written about the Pietà. And for some ridiculous reason, art history seems to, modern art history seems to try to tell us that that work wasn't a, uh, 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 an altarpiece. I've heard everything. It was kind of a decoration that was on the floor, basically like a doorstop. <laughs> 
They go, why don't you carve me a pit top and use it as a doorstop? That makes loads of sense to me. Um, but the one thing that you actually find very strongly in, um, in sort of 80s, 90s art history is this absolute determination to refuse to see that as an altarpiece, when indeed all the people who write on pietas in Northern Europe, they explain to us that the reason why you make them is generally for altarpieces. They are, um, it does have two functions. Either you put them out for a kind of uh, uh, Lenten imagery, or if it's going to be out of a permanent material, you're going to stick it on top of an altar, and it's going to become an altar piece. So the Pieta, and, and actually a, a, a very important art historian found a document by Le Grula, who says, I want you, he was commissioning masses for the altar decorated with the Pieta that I have commissioned from Michelangelo. So now we actually have it from the horse's mouth that the thing is supposed to be an altar piece. This is of in, incredible importance for understanding what Michelangelo is doing here. Um, the Pieta is uh, a work he gets, um, he's, uh, he's 22 years old, it's his first public commission. He gets a single block of marble, it took a year to get that, that single block of marble. To get the marble from Florence or from Carrara to Rome took a year, which means that that was a FedEx bill beyond your imagination. And um, it was uh, followed by the fact he had a year time limit. By the time the marble got in, he had a little bit less than a year and a, a little bit over, a little bit less than a year and a half to be able to get the work in on time for 1500. And it was very important to Legrula that the work be ready by 1500. Legrula died three weeks before the work was done. The, um, the, the real problem, however, is not going to be the time limit, and it's not going to be the no mistakes clause. It's going to be the fact that there is no pietà in Italy. The Italians don't like the subject matter. The Italians like bouncing baby boys on their knees. They do not like the image of Mary holding her dead son on her lap. The pietà was actually invented by the Germans as the Vesper build in the in the 1530s. I'm sorry about you getting your pee repeat on the last night there. The, um, it's invented in the 1300s by the Germans as the Vesper build. It was actually meant to be to be prayed in front of on the Vespers of Good Friday. That's its, its function in many ways. Um, the uh, Pieta was then picked up by the French, and the French are the ones who will give it the name Piete, which means to feel sorry for. So obviously a huge component in the rendering of this image of the Mary and the lifeless Christ. The idea is you're supposed to feel compassion. We're supposed to evoke <coughs> compassion on the part of the viewer. The Germans and the French have a different way of evoking compassion than the Mediterranean folk do. And one of the biggest elements in these German and French versions is to make this almost <laughs> unnatural torture of the body of Christ. The word I always think of is an Italian strazio, just this, this tormented, suffering body. It's kind of the, the Franciscan's gone over the edge in the other direction. Um, here you have this incredibly awkward, angular body of Christ. Um, I don't have a good close-up of this, but that is a monster gaping wound in his side with like all carved blood around it. They'll frequently make them out of wood or clay so they can paint them and get all of these extra details. This kind of, these sharp points this rigor mortis of Christ's lap. Mary's face is crumbling here. Mary's face is sort of, her, her brow is furrowed in grief. And it makes this cross composition, which is very stark and angular.